Welcome back to Biosignaling on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the basics of the canonical wind signaling pathway. So first of all, wind is a chemical signal that's going to cause a variety of changes in cells when wind binds to its corresponding receptor. And here we're going to discuss the biosignaling pathway, and that is the canonical wind signaling. There's another non-canonical wind signaling pathway that we'll discuss in a separate video. This is the canonical one, meaning it's uh, the most common one that we're going to encounter. And honestly, with any of these signals, we can talk about TGF beta, all this stuff, the effects of wind are very, very broad and diverse and depend on the organism and cell type. So we're not going to go over the functions because we'd spend an entire week talking about that. So we're just going to go over the signaling pathway. And we really have to talk about this first in the case where there's no wind present. So first of all, wind's receptor is called frizzled, kind of a strange name, but it, it's, uh, or, its uh, or origin is Drosophila, and no offense to Drosophila people, but people who name things in Drosophila name things very strange. So this is the wind receptor, also called frizzled, sits in the plasma membrane of the cell. There's also a wind co-receptor called LPR6, and really if uh, wind is going to bind, it's actually going to bind more or less to both of these, and they're going to have to kind of come in closer proximity. But there's no wind here. Now when there's no wind, we have this uh, complex of proteins right here. There's a bunch of them, DVL, axin, APC, and we have two enzymes here. These are kinases. The GSK3 is a glycogen synthase kinase 3. Um, GSK or glycogen synthase kinases, these enzymes do not just phosphorylate glycogen synthase. They actually have many other target proteins. And then this one, CK1, is casein kinase 1. And this entire complex of really five proteins, at least that I have shown here, is called the beta-catenin destruction complex. So what does that mean? Well, in order to have Wnt genes, Wnt target genes expressed, we have to have this uh, transcription factor called beta-catenin. It has to go into the nucleus and bind to uh, certain sites that turn on transcription of Wnt target genes. So beta-catenin has to make its way into the nucleus. Now, the reason this is called the beta-catenin destruction complex is this complex will actually bind beta-catenin, and particularly the GSK3 and CK1 will phosphorylate the beta-catenin. These are the two kinases they phosphorylate beta-catenin. Pretty much when beta-catenin gets phosphorylated, that stimulates two processes in this order. One, ubiquitination. So ubiquitination is the process by which ubiquitins, which are protein chains, get uh, attached onto particular residues of the protein, and that will ultimately stimulate that protein's destruction by the proteasome. So all in all, when this catenin destruction complex phosphorylates beta-catenin, you see the phosphate right here, that triggers beta-catenin's proteolytic destruction or degradation by the proteasome. And obviously if beta-catenin is destroyed, it cannot enter the nucleus and act as a transcription factor. So in this case, when target genes remain transcriptionally off. Okay. Now, um, as long as this beta-catenin destruction complex is just floating around here, um, mostly in the cytoplasm, it's going to phosphorylate beta-catenin. Okay. And it's just going to keep phosphorylating it and keep uh, having those wind target genes off. All right. But something different is going to happen when we actually have wind. So now I've rearranged this a little bit. So here's the wind protein right here, um, ribbon diagram. It's going to bind to the frizzled, the wind receptor, and it's also going to recruit this uh, co-receptor LPR6. And notice what else is happening. Okay. This entire beta-catenin destruction complex is inactivated and immobilized. And it's really immobilized to the Wnt receptor and the LPR6. Um, so what happens is, is the, the complex sort of rearranges itself. And then glycogen synthase kinase 3 and casein kinase 1, um, they interact with LPR6 and they can no longer bind to beta-catenin. And so having said that, these two enzymes can no longer phosphorylate beta-catenin, and so beta-catenin is not destroyed. Okay? In the previous slide, we saw that when beta-catenin was phosphorylated by these two kinases, that leads to its destruction. 
okay, initially by ubiquitination and then by the proteasome. But if beta-catenin is not phosphorylated, uh, it's free to enter the nucleus and it's going to bind to uh, this transcription factor that's already going to be here called TCF. And when TCF is actually uh, bound in conjunction with beta-catenin, that will actually turn the transcription of Wnt target genes on. And that's how we're going to get uh, the downstream uh, genetic effects of Wnt signaling. Okay? Notice in the case where we have no Wnt, this TCF transcription factor is actually there. It just the way it functions is it keeps the target genes for Wnt off. When beta-catenin binds in conjunction with TCF, it turns the genes on. Okay, So really the key with Wnt signaling is it has to do with whether or not beta-catenin is not phosphorylated, in which case the Wnt target genes are on, or whether the beta-catenin is phosphorylated. Okay, in which case the Wnt target genes are off because beta-catenin is degraded by proteasomes. Okay, And whether or not it's phosphorylated depends on whether or not you have a functioning beta-catenin destruction complex. So in summary, when Wnt binds to this receptor, it recruits all these proteins to the receptor and this co-receptor, LPR6, that inactivates slash immobilizes the beta-catenin destruction complex, which leaves the beta-catenin free from phosphorylation and also free to enter the nucleus and turn on its target genes. And then we get the effects of Wnt signaling, which depend on whatever cell we're talking about and whatever developmental stage, because as we said, Wnt is going to be very important in developmental biology. All right, so hopefully this video made sense. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next video, we're going to go over notch delta signaling, which is another pathway for biosignaling that you may see in developmental biology. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.